Well, good evening and welcome to Politics and Prose Live. I'm Brad Graham, the uh, co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And we have a very engaging event for you this evening featuring Dorothy Wickenden and her new book, The Agitators. Dorothy, of course, is a very experienced magazine editor. She worked at the New Republic and Newsweek before becoming executive editor of The New Yorker 25 years ago. She also wrote a well-received book that came out in 2011, Nothing Daunted, which is a family memoir about how a century ago, her grandmother and a friend abandoned their society life in New York to teach school in the wilds of Colorado. In the agitators, Dorothy again goes back in history, this time to the 19th century and the path-breaking efforts then of three women, Harriet Tubman, Martha Wright, and Frances Seward were friends and co-conspirators in fighting for the abolition of slavery and the advancement of women's rights. Dorothy portrays the women and their times in vivid, compelling detail, illuminating the inspiring legacies of these activists whose stories resonate to this day. As Publishers Weekly says in a review, Dorothy's book is an essential addition to the history of American progressivism. Conversation with Dorothy this evening will be Jelani Cobb, who's on the faculty at Columbia's Journalism School and also is a staff writer at The New Yorker, where he covers race, politics, history, and culture. In addition, he's written several books, the most recent of which, The Substance of Hope, examined the forces and changes in American society that led to Barack Obama's election as president. For those of you not familiar with how this virtual format works, uh, although you're not visible to us, you'll still be able to ask questions if you like. To do so, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. The chat function also will be active. And in that column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of The Agitators. So please join me um, in Politics and Prose in welcoming Dorothy Wickenden and Jelani Cobb. Hi, Dorothy, how are you? I'm well, how are you, Jelani? Good to see you again. Yes, yeah, I wanna say long time no see, but it's really not that long. <laughs> yeah, maybe like yesterday. <laughs> right, well, I mean, it depends on how we, we use the word see. Uh, I mean, right. if I say as a, as a pixel box on my computer screen, then it's 24 hours. But uh, if we meet in person, then it's been more than a year now. Yeah, more than a year. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy to be able to talk with you uh, about the book. And, you know, I've been a, a fan of this book from before it came out. And I uh, really think that it's, you know, fascinating and, and looking forward to getting into more detail about it. Great. Um, well, it's, I love talking to you about this. And, you know, we've had so many discussions over the years, Jelani, about social movements and how mm -hmm. they form and how they develop. And, you know, I thought maybe I could just start by talking a little bit about why I chose these three women to mm -hmm. focus on. And as Brad mentioned at the beginning, my first book was about Auburn, New York, which is where my grandmother grew up. And while I was there researching that book, I just happened to go to the uh, Seward House Museum because that's where William H. Seward and his wife, Frances Seward lived. And while I was there, I got this uh, a private tour and I learned about Frances Seward who has, had basically been forgotten by, by history because her husband, you know, who sort of overwhelmed everyone he, he ever met was one of the great, as you know, one of the great 19th century politicians. Uh, he aspired to the presidency. He was a huge personality, big anti-slavery uh, spokesman at a time when most people would not say a word about the subject. But I, in that tour, I started getting really, I knew a little bit about him, fascinated by him, but I started getting really interested in Francis Seward. Uh, because I was told that down around the corner, her best friend, Martha Coffin Wright, had a house where she lived with her husband and six children. And it was a very conservative town, uh, sort of an uh, early industrial town, thriving business center, but people were extremely conservative. And Frances Seward and Martha Coffin Wright were not. And so they immediately became friends uh, and, and saw each other all the time over tea. They would talk, yes, they would talk about their children, but they would talk about politics and about the very early 
uh, sort of eruptions of, of uh, by women's rights advocates and about abolition. And they read, uh, Frances was uh, born to an aristocratic family. She had a house full of servants. She was quite uh, introspective and shy. Uh, very unlike Martha, but their their interests were, were very, very similar. And she had a huge library. She read all the time. And so she would hand these revolutionary pamphlets to Martha. And Martha would read them and then they'd talk about them. Uh, so they became great friends in the early 1840s. And it may seem unlikely that they would cross paths with Harriet Tubman of all people. And so that's what I learned when I, was, when I was at this museum that Harriet Tubman made Auburn, New York, one of her regular stops when she was uh, an underground railroad conductor in the 1850s. And she became friendly with Frances Seward and Martha Coffin Wright. So I thought, well, that's an amazing story. And that, so I had to finish the book I was working on at the time, which was about my grandmother, but this is an earlier generation of women. And it, it just, it happened to be the same same town. And I just thought there must be an untold story here. People, how many people, how many Americans who have not, who are not scholars and haven't studied Harriet Tubman know that she spent 48 years of her life in Auburn, New York. It just seems completely bizarre. Mm -hmm. So in order to tell that story, I had to get to know more about Martha Coffin Wright and Frances Seward because I wanted to know, one of the things I wanted to find out was how the Underground Railroad worked. And this seemed like a great way to do it. So along the way, I got deeper and deeper into it. And so it became kind of this triple biography as well. Well, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, people don't really think of Auburn, New York uh, as a, a place of historical consequence uh, outside of knowing those specific details that you know. And, but this book is, it almost seems like the crossroads of the world. Like there are all sorts of things happening there and uh, these consequential conversations that people are having. And uh, I just wonder, you know, about how you approached uh, researching, you know, this project, uh, you know, one, there's the the part that's in at Auburn, but it has, the story has tentacles that go throughout the country, literally. Uh, and then you have Harriet Tubman, who was a person uh, who did not leave a trove of correspondence, uh, was not able to read and write. And, you know, she's a crucial part of this story as well. And so I wanted to just, uh, like how that, how you went about doing that. Yeah, so it was, um, you're a writer, so you know, the, and you're, you're a biographer, so you know the tricks, you have to kind of develop tricks to kind of figure out how to assemble your story. And especially when you have three people to write about and each, so, and they were working together, uh, you know, on the Underground Railroad and they uh, they talked all the time. Well, they, whenever Tubman came through town, um, but they also went their separate ways and they went about, their their um, their mission, which was which was the same, which was to abolish slavery and procure equal legal rights for women, um, and they wanted equal legal rights for Black Americans too. Again, these were it's hard to emphasize enough to the audience that these were just unbelievably radical ideas at the time. Um, and it was particularly unusual for this aristocratic woman to sort of, uh, you know, decide that no, she really, her, her goal in life was to, you know, to, to uh, convince her husband behind, from behind the scenes uh, to do, to enact his beliefs, which was ultimately to abolish slavery. Mm. So to, what I did, um, what I finally decided in order to tell the stories was each, what were the defining moments for each of these women? And there, there were particular ones for each of them. So Frances, who, you know, huge reader, she had gotten for that era a very good education. And so she had read a lot. She had read John Stuart Mill. She had Mary, read Mary Wollstonecraft, who, who, you know, many years earlier had, you know, had some of these same ideas in England. And she, um, so she'd read Wollstonecraft, who wrote about women and how women were you know, these benighted creatures who were expected to be at the beck and call of their husband, you know, all the husbands all the time, that they were taught to be frivolous and not to have any serious ideas. And so she was very much of that frame of mind. And Wollstone, Wollstonecraft's sister 
also was a victim of spousal abuse. And so Frances had read about that, never imagining that this would be something she would encounter in her life. And in 1833, as I was beginning to do my research, I found this letter that Frances wrote to William H. Seward, her husband, who was in Albany at the time. And it was just, it was a, 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 an anguished cry for help. And, you know, so Lizette, her, her sister lived around the corner and she was being beaten up regularly by her husband. And there was nothing either one of them could do because at the time, that was 1833, women had no legal rights at all. And in fact, women, uh, men were, uh, it, completely free to do whatever they wanted to their wives, including beat, beating them up and sometimes killing them. So th she wrote, you know, this is an outrage. And, you know, why are the divorce law, why are the divorce laws the way they are? And this is a time when nobody talked about divorce and this is unjust. And why did these white men write these laws in a way to, that, that made women, you know, put women in this impossible position. So that just was her, her awake, her real awakening to her uh, belief in women's rights. And then a couple of years later, she, she had a lot of health issues and she and her husband took a long summer trip to the South. And she, of course, she had read about slavery. She was opposed to slavery, but she had never been South. And they went to Virginia and they stopped, they made a stop one afternoon and they heard the sounds of weeping and moaning and soon um, their carriage stopped and soon they saw a line of 10 naked little boys being tied together by a rope led by a slaver who sent them to a slave trough to drink and then sent them into a shed. And as she wrote in her journal about this, and then they sobbed themselves to sleep. And this was, Frances was um, hypersensitive, extremely empathetic, and it affected her so deeply. And she said, she wrote in her journal, slavery, slavery, that the, the evil was, you know, just kept, kept coming before me, you know, every day I couldn't get it out of my mind. So that was her awakening to, her real awakening to abolition. She had seen it and there was no going back for her. So she, in the course of her, I wanted to tell the story, the arc of her story was how she took her, you know, this very cerebral, um, shy woman who did not like the political life her husband was leading at all. Seward was a United States Senator for, you know, in Washington, she lived in, in Auburn. She just didn't, and she went down to Washington, you know, once a year to help him with his parties. She hated the parties. She hated the fact that Washington was a slave, a town where slavery was legal. And she lived her, and again, this was a very odd thing for her to do. She insisted on leading her own life in Auburn. And once her father died, she did, lived in her childhood home. And once her father died, she decided, I, I am now become, be going to become more active in abolition. And she converted their basement, their original basement kitchen into a haven for, for freedom seekers. And Martha had done the same thing around the corner in Auburn, in the early 1840s. So both of them were active by then on the Underground Railroad. And that was when Harriet Tubman liberated herself from slavery on the Eastern shore, walked a hundred miles to Philadelphia, got a job in Philadelphia, found a place to live and got to know all of the abolitionists in, in town. One of whom was Martha's older sister, Lucretia Mott who, as you know, was this great early human rights advocate. And she had been, she was a Quaker minister. So she had no compunction about speaking in public. Otherwise women, women didn't speak in public, forget it. Uh, so she, it, 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 was, it was Lucretia Mott clearly, who one time when Martha went down to, to visit her on a family visit, introduced Martha to Harriet Tubman. And then when Tubman came the next time, probably she came through Auburn, she, Martha would have introduced her to Francis. So this was kind of, this was the, the this was a networking uh, opportunity for women who were able to go kind of under the radar because they were so dismissed, you know, they weren't worth, worth notice, um, especially a black woman. I mean, she could be, and you know, nobody really knew her, who she was in the early days. So this was, and once Tubman had met these two women. She had a very keen sense of whom she could trust and whom she couldn't, which she had to have on the Underground Railroad. 
but she did, you know, abolitionists didn't work alone. They were, and this was the other thing that interested me so much when I was researching the book, how did it work? How did this system, the Underground Railroad, which worked so successfully for almost half a century, how did people actually do it? And so this was one of the ways, one of the ways they did it. And um, there were New York, you talked about New York State, and people don't mostly don't know this now because so much of New York State, especially Western New York State, was extremely conservative. But there were these pockets of, of and, and not New York City so much, which was, you know, highly conservative and a sort of pro-slave city. But as you went west, uh, people had, through the Second Great Awakening, people had kind of come to terms with the idea that slavery was an evil and, it, and that it was it, it, like Quakers that you had to, if you believed it was, a, it was an evil, you had to do something about it. So there were these pockets of extreme radicalism uh, through, across New York state. And so that was the beginnings of this kind of burbling up of the beginnings of the, the second American revolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's fascinating. If we could stay with um, uh, Francis for one second, one of the things that's fascinating about the narrative um, you bring about her life and her the arc of her uh, development is the fact that she is attached to this person who history regards in these immense terms, and you know his uh, irrepressible conflict speech uh, is is thought of as a fundamental part of the rhetoric of anti-slavery and, and so on. Uh, but time and time again <laughs> in this story, you, you see Francis intervening and, and almost stiffening his spine. Uh, and she seems to be you know, to the left of him on, on the question. Uh, and, you know, there, there are two really well honed consciences uh, about uh, the issue of slavery. Uh, but, you know, hers is the one that seems to be the, the least patient with his ex continued existence. Yeah, and this was one of the things that it, it, one of the things that interests me about about women um, and also about African Americans, and because they, until very recently these stories were they were they were of no interest to 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 mo to, to white male historians who were who made up the large part of scholarship of the of the time, uh, and so these stories just weren't they just weren't told, and so when you know to, when, how do you recreate um, history when it doesn't when, it, when it's been basically overlooked by secondary sources. Well, you go back to original sources, and so that was why the letters, both Martha Wright and Frances Seward, were wonderful letter writers, and they wrote all the time. So Martha wrote to her sister Lucretia. She was incredibly funny and sardonic and sarcastic, and those were just great fun and, and also scathing about you know the 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 injustices that she experienced and what watched every day. And Francis wrote all the time to Seward. And as the years went by, and she and Martha kind of bucked up each other's, you know, courage on these issues. And as they got to know Harriet Tubman better, and they listened to Tubman's stories of what she had experienced in her first 20 years enslaved in, in Maryland, and what she was doing on her own, going back, nobody did this, going back into the heart of slavery and taking people out. Um, I mean, these were just incredibly, she risked her life each time, she risked the lives of all of her passengers. So Martha and Francis were basically kind of stuck at home and are be constantly, constantly being told women are, you know, are, are, are just, you know, kind of decorative objects and black women, you know, the, you know, are not worth anything. They, they got to know this woman and they, they became very close to her and they saw every time she came through, they, they saw what this was. And so they are becoming more and more radical. Well, Seward, as a senator, the more time he spends in Washington, and, and this is a familiar, a familiar thing today, and um, as he begins to hope that he's going to run for president, and then at, instead, Lincoln be, becomes the president in 1860, the slot that, that Seward hoped he would hold, and he becomes Lincoln's secretary of state. And Lincoln and and Seward had a much more, at the beginning of the war, 
1861 and in trying to prevent the war before that, they had a more moderate position. They were, this was the Republican party was very new and they wanted, they hoped still, even though to Francis and all of these abolition, Martha and Ole abolitionists, it was clear that the country had completely split apart mm -hmm. and there was no way to reach compromise with these Southerners politicians, you know, they were, they cared about the union. And so this, they both, and they believed both, they were in completely, in complete sync on this. They both believed and said constantly in the early years, this is, this is a war to save the union. This is not a war to liberate the slaves. And so Frances is right. This is how she rebelled. You know, she didn't go out and I can talk about how Martha did it. She didn't go out in public and do it because her husband didn't want her to do that because it would hurt, hurt him politically. But she wrote to him all the time. And she said, you've got to move more quickly on this. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, 4 million people are being enslaved. You're not, you're not fulfilling, you know, you, you are betraying your own conscience. So this was, and he would defend himself. And so there's this incredible back and forth in these letters. And this is such a great revelatory way to begin to understand, again, how this, how abolition kind of, moved forward to the extent it did and how that movement really brought on the Civil War. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just talking about this connection between abolition and the advocacy of women's rights, you know, there are points at which the impediments that they faced as women became impediments <laughs> for abolition. Uh, and you know, one of the things you talk about early on, the best examples of that is uh, the Anti-Slavery Society meeting in Philadelphia in 1838, I think it is. Yeah, uh, the first meeting was 1833. When, when Is that the one you met or the later, you're talking about the later one? Yeah, I'm talking about the one where all hell broke loose. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. And, yeah, <laughs> and if you could just talk a little bit about that and, and how people forged this connection between those two causes. Well, so the first, I thought you were mentioning it, you were uh, talking about the first meeting of the American Anti-Slavery Society, which was William mm -hmm. Lloyd Garrison's group. And it was, of course. Well, that one too, all, right. Yeah. yeah. And so that was, that was all men. And mm -hmm. uh, that at that meeting, Martha happened to be in Philadelphia at the time. And Lucretia Mott, again, by then, 1833, she was a lot older than Martha. And she had been working side by side with these men for many years on abolition. So, and they had, so at the last minute, someone decided, oh, we better invite, you know, Lucretia Mott. I mean, it's kind of rude not to. So they invited her and, and Martha stayed at home to write to her husband because she wasn't into this yet. And Lucretia went to the meeting and the men were completely horrified that there was a woman there. Uh, and she dared to, to change one of the resolutions that they, they suggested. And, and after that, the American Anti-Slavery Society split in two because Garrison believed that women should be part of it and other the more conservative members did not. So Lucretia went home and she decided, all right, well, if we're not allowed, gonna be allowed to join you know, the men in their conventions, we're gonna start our own society. So she got together with her African-American free, free, free women in Philadelphia and other white women. And they, they, they created a, uh, an integrated group of women who would do the same thing that the, the male abolitionists were doing. And so at the same time a society was forming, actually I think it was an all black society was forming in Salem and there was another group forming in Boston. So the, then the 1837 meeting you mentioned, I think that was in New York. And I believe that Lucretia was the president that year. And that, that was when a mob, you know, assembled outside because they heard that William Lloyd Garrison was there. And there was another very famous English uh, abolitionist who both of them had been invited to, to speak because they were friends and they all worked together, even though they weren't part of the, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't assemble together, the, the two sexes. So this mob gathers, the mayor comes to the meeting and he said, ladies, you have to disband. This is, you know, this is too dangerous, you go home. And they didn't wanna go home, but they did because they, they realized they were shouting and the people were banging on the door and they were breaking into the building. And Garrison's sitting there writing a column for his newspaper. And then he escaped through an upstairs window, you know, into, goes into a, I can't remember what it is, some shop next door and they find him, they let him down, the mob, they, they let him down by a rope. They lead him, I think the rope is around his neck. They lead him uh, to Boston, the Boston Common where they intend to tar and feather him. And he's saved by the police at the last moment. 
But this was women's introduction to both to abolition and to their sense that, well, we want, we want our rights too. We want to be able to speak in public. We want to be able to join societies that men are able to join. And we want legal rights. So that finally came to be in 18, not until 1848, when Lucretia was in upstate New York and some of her friends from Philadelphia had moved to Waterloo. And so they were having a, a little gathering to welcome Lucretia. And so Lucretia and Martha went to Waterloo and the women and Elizabeth Cady Stanton was there, who was a little bit younger. And the women all started talking about, you know, this, this, is, this is really bad. And they all talked about how they hated being housewives. They, they, they needed their rights. And they said, well, let's call a convention. And they knew at that point sort of how to do it. So they did, 10, 10, 10 days later, they held a convention. And this was the key, key turning point for Martha Coffin Wright. So they, because before she's got six children, she's 41 years old, she's pregnant with her seventh child, and she's completely exhausted, but she's also catalyzed by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who's like this complete dynamo. And they, they, they organize this thing, they write their manifesto, um, one of them, Lucretia knows Frederick Douglass, who has just started North Star, his, his newspaper in Rochester. One of the women invites him to come. He's the most famous abolitionist in the world. He's delighted to come. He comes and uh, he at, at the Seneca Falls Convention, he meets Martha. And she was she, she was just bowled over by him. She she got she became his close friend. She, Elizabeth Cady Stanton saw that Martha had all of these innate talents and this kind of spark and that she was a rebel by nature. So she enlists her. And so Martha goes home from that convention and she's got these two great friends, uh, Frederick Douglass, who comes and you know stops at her house whenever he comes across on his lecture tour, shocking Martha's neighbors. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who says, you know, come on, you're gonna you're gonna work with me on this new movement, and this is basically the start of the uh, mostly white middle class uh, women's rights movement. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing the kind of connections uh, that you uncover and and explore. Uh, you know, because uh, obviously Martha Coffin uh, has that you know close tie to these movements through her sister. Lucretia, but just, you know, Frederick Douglass shows up here. Like every time you, you go through another chapter, there's another uh, kind of historic figure who's emerging onto the scene. Um, I do want to talk about another, you know, the, the third uh, in, of these uh, cistern, as we might call them, um, which is Harriet Tubman and uh, you know, what you learned about her in the process of this, if there was anything uh, you came away from and like, oh, wow, I didn't know that about her. And, uh... well, yeah, oh, there, were, there was so much. I, you know, like most Americans, I think what I knew about Harriet Tubman was minimal. Uh, you know, I, we, we all learned about her in grade school, basically. Oh, the great underground railroad conductor. And of course, you know, to this fabulous American hero, but, but not, but it was pre pretty, pretty, uh, pretty shallow. And I think as I was working on the book, when I talked to people about Harriet Tubman, people tended to know that she was this great underground railroad conductor. They didn't know that she had insisted on and found a way to go down to South Carolina to Port Royal, uh, which was occupied uh, by 1862 uh, by the uh, Union forces. And she, you know, she didn't want to stay back. She wanted to be, take part in the war. And so she had, she was this incredible, she was just basically a genius as a strategist. That's kind of the way I came to think about her. She had all of these gifts. But one of the things she knew how to do was to get what she wanted. And one of her, she, she knew, she knew all the abolitionists, and she made it her business, you know, all the abolitionists in Philadelphia, and then quickly got to know those in New York State who could be useful to her. And in Boston, where there were all of these wealthy transcendentalists and abolitionists just looking to kind of, you know, give money to a good cause, she quickly saw that, got to know as many of them as she possibly could. And one of them, 
I think it was Edna Dow Cheney said, you know, Harriet Tubman, and this is how you learn, this is how I began to piece Harriet Tubman's life together by seeing what other people said about her. And they, many of them wrote down the stories she told, including Martha, so that I could, even though she couldn't read or write, I believe that she she created her own oral history by telling mm -hmm. these stories over and over again to the people mm -hmm. whom whom she loved and trusted. And she, wa she wanted to be known. And so what I tried to do in here was create the kind of hair, kind of story about her in a narrative form that I think she wanted us all to understand. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that Edna Dow Cheney said was, you know, she has all the qualities of a great leader. And she really did. Mm -hmm. She knew how to, she knew the right people to get to know. She knew how to, um, she told a great story. I mean, when she spoke in public, she did it, you know, in, with incredible fervor and, um, and wit. I didn't ever think of her as a witty person. She was really quite funny, um, very matter of fact about the, the troubles she suffered and, you know, very, extremely uncomplaining. But whatever she set out to do, she figured out how to do it. And she got people to work for her. And that that's a great politician. And so I thought that was just really fascinating that here was someone who was completely outside the political system, as far away as you could possibly be. And yet she figured out how to use it to her advantage. And so her friendship with, with Frances Seward was extremely important because she knew that Frances had a direct line to the most powerful anti-slavery uh, statesman in the, in the country. So she knew that her story, she would tell her stories to Francis and, they, and that Francis would take them in and that she would become, she would help push uh, Senator and then Secretary of State Stewart in the right direction. Now, of course, you know, because of the time period you're writing about, the politics of this era, all of the, cumulatively, all the dynamics that are going on and, you know, of course, Stephen Douglas shows up and uh, Chief Justice Taney shows up and, you know, all these consequential figures who are pushing the country to the brink, the irreconcilable brink of the Civil War. Can you talk about how this played out and uh, the activities of these three different women in the course of the war? Yes, so the for Tubman and talking about these catalysts and what how how each of them kind of got it really drove her, how each drove herself to do what she ended up doing. So for all of them, I would say, and for the as for the country at large, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was was probably the biggest political catalyst. Uh, it was, and this was what radicalized, it radicalized the whole North and it really radicalized New York state. So even for, so this was the law for people who, who aren't familiar with it that uh, passed in 1850 as part of the compromise of 1850, it required free, the free states of the, New, of the North to return into bondage uh, people who had uh, people who had become free had been freed for years and were, you know, had their own lives and families up north. And people, so even conservative northerners, many of them found this uh, atrocious. Their, their states had, had abolished slavery years ago. What, what right did these people have to come in? And they didn't care that this was a federal law. They thought it was completely unjust. And so there, there were these, um, you know, these, these movements sprang up. And so when, when slave catchers came from the South and um, landed in one of these cities and uh, took one of these, uh, and one of these, they were often young men and intending to take them back into slavery, quickly they, the, the, these t cities in the North figured out these, they, they all had their little bands of, of abolitionists and they knew how to get the word out and the word got out immediately and they got together and they, they, they orchestrated these incredible rescues. So mm -hmm. Harriet Tubman happened to be in Troy when this happened with, with a young man, man named Charles Now. He was, uh, he, you know, sla he, he had es escaped from slavery in Virginia. He was working at a, um, I can't remember, um, uh, he was he, a carpentry shop or something, and he was arrested at his place of work. Uh, the, the word went out, Tubman was there. 
And so immediately a huge crowd, they, he's taken to the US commissioner's office, his crowd assembles, she's in the crowd. And it's a, it, it's a story in the book, and I won't tell the whole story, but she is a central figure in the rescue of Charles now. And so people, it's, that, that did not go without notice. There were reporters in the crowd. They were, so there were many newspaper stories about this, this woman who was known as, as Moses. And it was just a miracle that she appeared on the scene at just that time. And when, when Nal is read, led down the stairs and he's about to be taken you know, off, um, Tubman rushes and she's five feet tall. I mean, she's a tiny woman. She rushes in, she grabs Nal by the arm. She fends off the blows of the constables. The crowd gathers around them sort of protectively and they, they, she helps them escape. It's just unbelievable. Um, so it's that, that story I was able to assemble from, uh, from newspaper accounts. So, you know, there are contemporaneous ways to do this, as you know, and it's a bit of a trick narratively, but you can, it can be done. And that it was a great, it was just a great way to it's see amazing. how she did what she did. It's an amazing story. Yeah. Um, and I, I often think that, you know, the kind of experience that um, Frances Seward had when she saw slavery up close with her own eyes and just, you know, was completely uh, undone you know, by the evil of it. And, you know, the Future Slave Act really did that in reverse because people who disagreed with slavery um, or, or even hadn't thought much about it, all of a sudden it was in their neighborhood and people were so local, you know, at those that time that, that it automatically just says, well, uh, you know, what do you think about this issue? Uh, I don't know. I haven't thought very much about it. Well, I'm going to stick this issue right here. I'm going to take this person who you know, who's part of your local network of people, and we're going to send the federal government in to yank that person out. And yeah, and these were their neighbors and right. friends, and and they they went to their places of work, and you know, it was just and why you know Henry Clay and the others thought that this was going to put to rest all of the problems once and for all. It was it was just preposterous. Yeah. Daniel uh, Webster, you know, who, who tried to give a talk in Syracuse, which was you know, a completely radicalized town, and everyone that you know turned everyone even further against him. Yeah, it's just, it's, it, it's amazing. Um, and you can kind of kind of read, and I think we talked about this um, when you know I first saw the manuscript, that you can really read the history of the era through the lives and reactions of these three people and you know how they intersect and how they interact and so on. Uh, I know we're, that went by really quickly. <laughs> we're supposed to have, I have oh, more no, questions. no, I have questions to ask you. No, I have more <laughs> questions, but I think we're supposed to uh, make sure there's time for people to uh, bring in questions from the audience. Uh, and so we have one uh, who says, did you get any sense in doing this book about other key women whose stories have been overlooked? Yes, there were qu quite a few of them and well, Yes, and well, most obviously black women who, whose stories had been overlooked. And so this was one of the reasons the female anti-slavery societies were so interesting because you could see how active they were and played an enormously important role in all of this. Uh, so they, and they worked, it, it, Lucretia Ma, I must be said that <laughs> Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who also plays a role in the book, obviously she, did not have the most enlightened views on race. And it was, so that movement was largely, largely became a white movement. And later, later on, she, you know, she became, she, Stanton became quite, uh, quite overtly racist. Lucretia Mott though, and there were, there were a few others really, in, including the, uh, the Grimke sisters who were, who came from a slaveholding family in Charleston, South Carolina, and converted to Quakerism, and were also out on the the lecture circuit quite early. They they believed absolutely in integrate full integration, and so there's this incredible scene in the book too about the burning of Pennsylvania Hall, which was this great building that the abolitionists built so they could actually hold their meetings because most people who rented halls out did not want to rent to abolitionists. And so these, these female anti-slavery societies met there 
the night before the burning of, of Pennsylvania Hall, and both Lucretia Mott and one of the Grimke sisters gave these incredibly powerful um, speeches while stones were being hurled at the windows, the, you know, shattering all around them. And, you know, they were, these women were saying, don't be afraid of just, you know, this, this, this seeming danger. You know, we are completely safe. I, very, very courageous. And at the end of the meeting, the, uh, the white women and black women walked about, and there, there are thousands of men and boys outside, you know, with the intent to kill them. And they, do, they walk out, black women and white women, arm in arm, and they don't quite, the crowd doesn't quite dare to attack them. They hurl all kinds of insults at them, but they don't, they don't really hurt them. And, but then after they're gone, they, they, they actually follow Lucretia Mott intending to burn down her house, and that doesn't happen but they burned down Philip, Pennsylvania Hall. Mm -hmm. So again, the, the, the mob violence was just uh, incredible. And these- That, was, that was the incident I was asking about, actually. That's oh, what yeah, was, oh, yeah, Pennsylvania yeah. Hall. I said Philadelphia, yeah. I meant to say yeah. Pennsylvania Hall, yeah. right? Um, so anyway, there, there, and now in these, these women's stories, the black women were you know, absolutely pivotal in um, petitioning uh, uh, Congress for the abolition of slavery, and uh, did, uh, many of them did it on their own. Often they did it with their with white friends like Mott and the Grimke sisters, and they spoke. There were many of them were speakers too. Ellen so, Watkins Harper, I'm sure you've heard of her, Jelani, I mean, yeah. fabulous, fabulous character, and she was at one meeting later on, 1866, I think, and she it was the. Elizabeth Cady, this was after the war, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was trying to bring the abolitionists and the women together again because she really wanted to push for the women's right to vote. Very big issue. Um, and this is a time when, when black men really, really, really needed the vote because of what was happening in the South. And um, so Elizabeth Cady Stanton wanted this to be her great day. And um, Ellen Watkins Harper got up and she she totally lit into Elizabeth Cady Stanton. You white women, you talk about rights. I'm here to talk about wrongs. Oh, she was just so great. So it's really, it's really good to go back and, and read some of these stories that have been so neglected. So that's so funny. It's like kind of anticipating the other question, which was whether well, other black women in New York involved in abolitionist and or women right, women's rights movements. So um, yeah. Oh, could you, did you hear me? Uh, I missed that question, sorry. Oh, I said there was, you, you really anticipated the next question, which is, uh, were there other black women in New York involved in abolitionist and or women's rights movements? Yes, so, well, Sojourner Truth is the most obvious one. She was uh, quite a bit older than uh, Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass for that matter. Uh, and she had been an enslaved woman in New York, when mm -hmm. New York, when slavery was still legal, and she had had, I think, every child of hers was sold, and she was a remarkable figure. She was just as tall as Harriet was short, and a wonderful speaker herself. And so she was, and again, she was speaking in public at a time when it, it sort of wasn't done, and was really a formidable figure. And so she spoke. Um, the abolition, the, the American Anti-Slavery Society would often ask people like Ellen Watkins Harper and, uh, and Sojourner Truth to come and speak. So there, there was a, a real lecture circuit and they made themselves heard that way. Mm. And I can't um, remember what town Sojourner Truth was from, Ulster County, I think. Yeah, I don't know if she was uh, from, she was enslaved in New York and she was under the gradual admission, it, gradual emancipation um, or manumission laws. Yeah. Um, here's a here's a really interesting question that I have a kind of personal curiosity about. Uh, how does doing a deep historical dive for a book like this influence how you edit The New Yorker? Wow, I had never thought about that. Uh, you know, I think it actually has made a difference. I um, And I sort of alluded to this at the beginning, Jelani, Jelani and I, well, I have a podcast every week. And so I, I have the freedom to, to do whatever I want. And I often, as I was writing the book, I, and Jelani's really interested in um, radical social movements and sort of social movements of all kinds. And so was I, obviously. And so one of the things that I've been exploring um, in, in articles and in the podcast in recent years is, you 
you know, how to think about uh, what we have lived through in the past, well, let's just limit in the past four or five years, and some of the social movements of today that have grown up. So Black Lives Matter, Me Too. And I, the, one of the remarkable things about writing this book was how uh, relevant it felt and, and disturbingly, um, it, it, it was disturbing that we haven't gotten further ahead on some of these things. And so Jelani and I are always talking about, just yesterday we were talking about um, uh, the, the Derek Chauvin trial and about what we're seeing in Georgia as a, as a backlash against the, the election of two Democratic senators. Uh, so voter suppression. I mean, voter suppression is, is once again, you know, a major issue. So I, I hope that when I'm editing my pieces, the pieces that we write in, uh, that we run in the New Yorker, I'm bringing this, this historical background, you know, and kind of helping to try and deepen them to, uh, so that people understand that this stuff has, has a very, very long history. Look at the, the assault on the Capitol on January 6th. These, these white supremacists, you know, beating down the, the doors of the Capitol, wandering through the rotunda with confederate flags it is sickening how is this possible well there's a direct line from the 18 well way back from the founding of the country all the way to today and it just well i'd love to hear to, i'd love to hear jelani talk about this just to how the, these phases these cycles that the country goes through I mean, it is, it is fascinating. In, in just in the context we were talking about, you know, there's a question that says, can you compare the division in our country now to the division in our country uh, in the mid 1800s? And um, I mean, it's the, the division we have now is genealogical. It's uh, a descendant of that division, you know, in, in uh, conflicts that have never been fully reconciled. And even just a, a couple of hours before we started this conversation, you know, Major League Baseball announced that they were yanking the All-Star game out of Atlanta, you know, in protest uh, over the voting law there. Uh, and, you know, this is just the outset. <laughs> we're looking at these things, which are astounding. You know, the, the questions, uh, you mentioned the dire need for the vote uh, in the, the time period uh, that you wrote about. And we are looking at, uh, battles, full-blown political battles over access to the vote uh, 150 years, more than 150 years uh, afterward. Yeah, absolutely. It is, um, you know, and you recently wrote a piece about for the New Yorker, uh, and again, this is where, you know, sort of some of this stuff just, just kind of um, uh, dovetails. You, you wrote a piece about how parties die, and that was a piece that I was particularly interested in because, you know, <laughs> earlier in our and I, I recommend it to everybody because the 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 Whig Party plays mm -hmm. a big role in my book because that was what William Seward was a big mm -hmm. important member of the Whig Party, and then and he was quite reluctant actually to see it go. And Francis Seward saw way before William H. Seward saw that it was hopeless because the Whig Party was completely completely divided over slavery. It had Southern members, it had Northern members. It just was defunct. It wasn't going to work. She knew it. He just clung on and clung on. And she kept saying, why can't you listen to what, you know, your, your uh, abolitionist friends are saying? Because Frederick Douglass was writing to him saying, it's time, it's time, sir, to start a new party. And that was the birth of the Republican Party, which of course at the time was a very different party from what it is. Today. Uh, a very different party than what it is now. Uh, I mean, it's interesting, you know, to, to see, uh, you know, all those themes emerge and emerge. I mean, it's also terrifying. Um, you know, there's a question that someone has, uh, which is, uh, as you know, we in Arlington, Virginia, are trying to rename Lee Highway after John Mercer Langston, um, who's interesting footnote, grandfather of Langston Hughes and a Reconstruction era legislator. Uh, African American uh, legislature legislator uh, actually post Reconstruction uh, was when he was elected. And so, do you know if there was any interaction between the agitators and Robert E. Lee? No. 
I don't believe there, I don't believe there was. He was on the other side. And one of the, I will be right up front about this. And I thought about this a lot when I was writing. There's, you have to make, you have to stop somewhere. I mean, there's so many rabbit holes you can go into with the Civil War. And so I did give short shrift to, to the South because my characters are, for, you know, they're, they're Northerners, they're New Yorkers. And I wanted to tell it, you know, through the, through their, through their experiences and their, their uh, opinions. So no, there, the closest it came was uh, Martha's writes, one of her sons, her youngest son fought at Gettysburg. And there's a, there's an incredible, I was able to kind of piece together, and he was very, very badly wounded in, 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 at Little Round Top. And so I was able to piece together that. So Lee makes a, you know, kind of quick appearance, but there was no, no, there was no direct, direct connection. You know, there's an interesting um, epilogue part of it, which, I mean, I read lots of history and, you know, lots of narratives. Um, I found myself really moved, you know, by that last section where you're talking about um, the end of these women's lives and kind of what all they had accomplished and what work was left to be done. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Like they've come together, they're brought together by these tidal forces in history and they do this work. And uh, how do things turn out for these women at the end of their lives? Yeah, uh, well, and Tub, one, that was one of the tricks too in how, how to finish the book because Tubman, <laughs> she's just unbelievable. She lived into the 20th century. She didn't die until 1913. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to tell more of her story. I mean, 10 years she spent on the Underground Railroad. Then she, she, she played this incredible, we didn't even have time to talk about what she did during the war. She came back and she devoted the rest of her life to, to pursuing human rights in sort of uh, in various ways. And what, so she lived until she was 93. She was active until the very end, until she got very sick a year or two before she died. She, one, one of the things that Francis did uh, in 1859 was sell Harriet Tubman a house in Auburn. And we, I, we won't get into that because that's a, another whole story, but the, uh, remarkably, I thought, um, Francis died relative, relatively young. Harriet Tubman came back from the war in 1865. She settled in this house that Francis Seward had sold to her remarkably. Um, but she didn't, she, she didn't stop. This woman could not stop. She wasn't made to be a, you know, either a farmer. I mean, she worked her farm, but, or, you know, a housekeeper. She continued to raise money for the freed people of South Carolina. She, and she decided the greatest people in need were elderly, impoverished African-Americans. And she devoted the, probably the last decade of her life to raising enough money. She had no money herself. She worked for three years during the war, for the US, for the, for the Union Army. She was not paid for any of that work. She was really close to being, you know, penurious, but she raised totally selfless. So she raised enough money. She bought, she added to the property she had bought from Francis Seward. And she built with, with this money she raised from her friends in Boston, all these other people that she knew, she built this very um, small, humane nursing home for impoverished elderly. African Americans, and the, just recently, the National Park Service has taken over that property, and it's it's renovating it. And so people are, are once COVID has you know mm -hmm. left the scene, people can go can go visit it and get a real sense of. And then a, a, a mile away is is the Seward House. So just how close they lived. All three women are buried together in that cemetery, mm -hmm. beautiful Fort Hill Cemetery. So and then Martha. She died relatively young too. She lived longer than Francis did. She lived long enough to see all the terrible divisions between the abolitionists and the women's rights advocates and all their tensions over the 15th amendment and race um, tormented her. Uh, but she handed down this legacy of activism through generation after generation after generation. And so her descendants are still, they're very active in prison reform. So the Osborne Association is, is today one of the great prison reform movements. And it is run by, I, now I'll get the generations wrong, but one of her great, great, great 
granddaughter, something like that. I might have one extra great in there. Lucretia but, uh, Mott Osborne Wells, the great great granddaughter. I had it only the great great. Yeah. Yeah, I had it in my notes. Yeah. Um, you, you know, uh, that's really a, a kind of interesting. I, I first I interacted with the Osborne Association. Um, in New York uh, when I was writing about uh, pr prison reform and criminal justice and had no idea that they were uh, connected uh, to Martha Coffin Wright and that long uh, legacy of progressive uh, activity in that family. Yeah, and it just shows me too how important it is, even when you feel that you're not getting anywhere, you just have to kind of keep at it. And that was, you know, Harriet Tubman was completely dogged. And so they all were actually, um, as long as they lived. And Martha in one of the women's rights, uh, the, the 10th annual women's rights convention, um, which uh, uh, came after the war, she gave this speech and she knew it was gonna be generations before women got the vote, she knew it. But she, she wanted to kind of rev up the crowd. And she said, you know, soon people are gonna say, here come the women who are gonna do something. And I love that because it, it didn't happen right away, but women kept at it generation after generation and, and eventually, long after even uh, Susan B. Anthony was dead, they got the 19th Amendment. So, um, and that's why it's important now just to keep remembering that you have to, you, you have to keep, you have to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. So we have time for one more question to sneak in here, um, which is another good question. Uh, when you wrote your first book, you were inspired to write this one. So what's next? Oh, I hate it when people ask me that. Um, right now I'm on book tour. I, ha I don't actually have a fully formed idea yet. I'll be completely frank. And if I did, I probably wouldn't tell everybody because writers at the beginning of their projects are very, you know, they hold their secrets very tightly. Um, but I hope it won't take me quite as long as this book took to write, which was more than twice as long as the Civil War took to fight. Um, but I just want us to add one final story because I just, I just love it. And I've got it on my desktop here. When I was writing the book, a friend of mine who I had talked to about it, who writes for the New Yorker, she was walking down some street in New York and she saw one of those green army green postal collection boxes mm -hmm. and plastered all over it were these decals. And it was, a there was, they were photographs of Harriet Tubman, a very lovely photograph that actually was relatively recently discovered of Harriet Tubman. And underneath um, it was typed, Harriet Tubman, total badass. And I just <laughs> love that. And it just showed again, this contemporary, it just goes on, you know, it goes on. And it's, it's important to remember that. Um, well, I mean, that is a, a great note um, for us to conclude on. And, you know, I have uh, my copy of this rather handsome book jacket here. Um, and so uh, it is available at Politics and Prose. There is a link uh, in the chat to procure your copies. Um, and you know, Dorothy, it's been great talking to you. You too, as always, Jelani. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. Lonnie, great, great moderating, and um, thanks for the plug. Uh, and Dorothy's uh, such a revealing book. You know, it not only deepens our appreciation of total badass uh, Harriet <laughs> Tubman, but um, and our understanding of the abolition and women's rights movements, but also illuminates the important contribution previously overlooked of Martha Wright and Frances Seward. So fascinating history. Can, can I toss in one 10 second thing before we wrap up? One of the things that made me want to do this conversation is that I went to school in Washington, DC. I'm a graduate of Howard University. And I distinctly remember the first time I wandered into politics and prose. I'm a, a lifelong bookstore lover uh, and politics and prose is high on my list of bookstores that I love. Me uh, and too, because so, I yeah. was in Washington too. It's just the greatest. Yeah, so. it's such a it's such a wonderful institution that I, I was I just leaped at the chance to leapt at the chance to uh, do something in dialogue with you all and with Dorothy. Well, it's very kind of you both to say, and we are open for business, so please keep wandering in. Um, to everyone watching, uh, thanks again for tuning in, uh, and from all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well, 